What's up, everybody? Welcome to Mike Dawes Has a Podcast. My name is Mike Dawes, and I do, in fact, have a podcast. This show is all about guitar, guitarists, and the music industry. Joining me on this journey are some friends who I've met on the road over the years, and I'm honored to share some conversations with guests I'll be meeting for the first time. Let's dive right into it. Kaki King, welcome to the little podcast thing. It's so good to meet you finally after years of not actually meeting you. And uh, I just, It is strange that we have not ever crossed paths at all. Yeah, it is weird. Um, so you've been like a big influence on, on, on my own sort of guitar music world since Aww. since the very beginning and i know we've been at the same events and like you, know, have you, you've done thomas's boot camp right did you do that no, no? okay but you did I, the now show know with the, Tom, i know thomas yeah. and, and we're buds and i mainly seek parenting advice from him <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. And I, I know the NAM show, you were there with the Tone with Amp guys who were obviously working on this this podcast um, in different years. But yeah, so good to finally get a chance to talk to you. And I appreciate you taking the time. So sure. so first of all, uh, where where are you right now? And, and how has lockdown kind of changed things for you? Like maybe we maybe we ease, ease, ease me into that one. Um, right, now I'm, <laughs> right now I'm in my, my uh, living room. I don't know. It's a room in my home. And, um, and that's, that was the easy answer. Um, lockdown is, is not great. What can I say? It's not great. I am not, um, I'm not happy and I'm not in acceptance and I'm not like, cool, cool. This is wonderful. Um, I think summer was, I'm an out, I'm a, I'm a very much like, I need to get out of, out of the house outside it's far away from my house, actually thousands of miles away <laughs> from my house, preferably. So it's been, it's been challenging, uh, for sure. Absolutely. Well, I totally feel that. And, and also I've done quite a lot of these kind of podcast type things myself. Um, and, and a lot of the questions that I was getting was, you know, how are you like smashing it through lockdown and like, let's motivate all the listeners and all of this kind of stuff. And, and mm-hmm. I, I'm totally relating to your vibe. It's, I think it's okay to acknowledge that it is pretty shitty. And, uh, I and think you're in- the lesson is not, I mean, for, I, I just think that the lesson is like to survive this. It's yeah. not to like go above and beyond. It's just, you know, the lesson for me is not like, oh, like how many records or things can I, can, how many things can I make and produce? I mean, the truth is there is a lot of, of death mm. going on. The reason that we're not leaving our homes and the reason we've lost our jobs is because people are dying and to just flat out ignore that as if that's not happening. So I can like make my shit is, is just too much, too many mental gymnastics for me to go through. So, you know, I've done some things I've, you know, tried to make a tiny, tiny little fraction of the money that I used to make, but I'm for the most part, keeping the stress off. Also, I have two little kids Mm. and that's just, 99% 99% of my mental energy is going to go to there. Sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. And um, it's actually really refreshing to talk to someone who kind of shares that that mindset, to be honest. Like, uh, if er- anyone's listening and feeling guilty for not producing their normal yeah, wave don't. of content, absolutely. Don't. absolutely. And what I've been telling people, too, is like, before you could sort of passively... I mean, the world was always out there and it was always scary and weird and unjust and you know so you could you could passively ignore the world maybe like you know your 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 personal life and then the you know the global life and and in in order to kind of bypass those things you could you could get to a deeper truth either by attacking them all you know full on or ignoring them and creating art that just takes you away there is no passively ignoring this there is no this is like to actively ignore like the screaming, you know, panic and death and fear and disease um, and loss of people that you love and fear for your safety and your loved one's safety. Like that is so difficult. And it's almost, it's almost inhuman to just say, well, I just, you know, I'm going to like act as if that's not happening. And the truth is I understand the impulse to create. And I think that is amazing. And the people that are getting through this with, by making things, unbelievable like absolutely hats off Uh, it's incredible and there have been a lot of pandemic inspired projects that have really moved me um however i think 
it is a bit gauche to pretend as if, well, we're really just stuck in our house for no reason other than we kind of just have to stay home right now. Um, and so I think that that totally ignoring the reality outside of your home in order to like get people to come to your live stream is um, unrealistic. Totally, totally. Well, yeah, I, t- I totally agree. And and this the, the pandemic is very close to home here. Obviously, everyone's suffering from this thing and, and a lot of people are affected in different ways. But um, I'll just tell you, just yesterday, I found out that both my parents have been exposed to it because so some, well, well, they're waiting for the test results. But, but this yeah. is something that um, this is something that I, I'm just going to express a little bit of a little bit of anger in the nicest possible way, not to be too much of a downer. And, and who knows yeah. how, how well this will read in the future. But, you know, this is a very uh, this is a testament to the frustration and how some people are dealing with this. So my dad is a sort of carpenter, like handyman, and uh, and he's been working on someone's kitchen for the past three days. This person didn't tell him that he had symptoms and was awaiting test results because, of course, he wanted to get his kitchen done before Christmas, you know. And then the results come in, and now my parents are both in isolation, and my mum's one of the at risk kind of people. And it's my sister had a scare, and my my cousin got it, my uncle got you know. It's 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 a very real thing, and and I do see and I talk to a lot of people who are kind of you know complaining that they're bored with it, and I think. I understand that frustration, but I think um, it, it can just be a click of the fingers. It can be tomorrow that someone you care about is affected by it. You know, there's so many people out there carrying on business as usual because it's not close to home yet, and it's become like furniture in the background. You know. Yeah. Well, and I can even say um, I was an early adopter. I got it in March before. Oh wow we knew. Mm. Um, and well, you're in New York, which was yeah, like one of the I huge yeah, hotspots. Yeah. So I live in New York and I was, you know, and I wasn't even out and about, I was making a record that I just managed to, to release last month. But, um, yeah, like, Oh, sh- you know what? Hang on, Mike, I have fucked up. I have to go answer that door That's and then right. I have to relocate. Okay guys, because real life doesn't stop during these podcasts, Kaki had to nip out for a moment. And she's right back. And here we go. Welcome back. Um, <laughs> is everything okay? Everything is fine. Fantastic. Well, you were talking about being in New York and, and you you had COVID in March. Well, yeah, we, um, so I was making an album, which at, at the time I thought would just be one of many projects of 2020, you know? Yeah. So, and I, and I, so I guess I didn't put as much energy into the record as I normally would have, because it was a companion piece to a theater show that I had just completed. And it was like, you know, almost, I mean, I, I, I like it, but, um, we started the record on March 2nd when COVID was a, like a, a, a kind of a whisper, maybe a couple news articles and things saying, be careful. And we ended in lockdown. We ended mixing, you know, completely in lockdown. And despite, you know, myself, just, I mean, we all of us in the studio were just basically being in the studio. Uh, we did all spread coronavirus to each other. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And everyone's fine. Um, but it is incredibly contagious. And uh, yeah, so we don't really know who gave it to who. We thought probably my wife gave it to me and I gave it to them, but she had, she never got sick and she never tested positive for antibodies despite like 12 people in her office getting it. I mean, it was very, very widespread. Yeah, there are some there are some weird things happening where, you know, a friend of mine, Jack Gardner, amazing electric guitar player, he, he lost his taste and smell, but thought it was because he gave up smoking. And uh, never got sick, never had anything, and uh, lives in Switzerland. Went and had a test, and he has the antibodies. Crazy. Yeah, um, it's very, it's very crazy, and um, I think that 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 is what is troubling is because there are so many cases where it really is very mild, hmm. and then there are so many cases where people, you know, young, healthy people or older, whoever, people die, and they sh- and really, technically speaking, they shouldn't. So it's not to be messed with. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, you know, it was, I, I had other than loss of taste and smell, I just had incredible exhaustion. So I didn't have really a clue as to what was wrong with me. And it took me over a month to feel okay. And 
in any like medical term, I would have been either asymptomatic or I would have been very, a very mild case or, you know, so, and it was brutal. Um, so, uh, yeah, like it is, you just do not underestimate this. Absolutely. Uh, here, here. And, and yeah, from somebody in New York and somebody in the UK right now, we're in lockdown. Uh, if you're listening, yeah, don't be a dick. Like, uh, you know, tr- yeah. be neighborly, you know, mask up and, and just it's treat so people easy. with respect. That's the, that's the crazy part. Yeah. But anyway, but yeah, well, guitar? Well, I, absolutely. Well, I was going to segue from that into the album because the album's out. It's called Modern Yesterdays. And I was going to, I was going to talk to you about that because it's, um, you know, I've been following your your work since I, I kind of want to say since the beginning, but technically it was your third record I bought in a record store when Aww. I was very young. It's uh, and it came as a double album with your first yeah. record. Yeah. So there was your first record, which is very much solo guitar, and your third record, which is just fucking fantastic. Yeah. Right. And I do want to talk about that. I want to talk about so many things with you because I'm just a big fan, to be honest. But, but let's like jump right forward to now, because this album, to me, listening to it, it does sound like you've kind of gone back to the roots a little bit. And it's very guitar based. It sounds like you're playing the ovation on it that with the big bass. Yeah. There's a lot of that. Was that a conscious thing going back to the, the sort of uh, so- guitar based stuff? This is the like the, the the short the short answer is that there was no I don't have many conscious ideas. They're all just things that I do, and I don't really there's no there's no strategy. <laughs> <laughs> but I was making Modern Yesterdays as a companion piece to a show called Data Not Found, which was this massive theater show that has a lot of incorporates a lot of different things. Um, main I mean mainly guitar playing, but other things as well. And so Modern Yesterdays was featuring about seven songs from that show and some other things that were kind of in the mix at the time. And also like, oh, just, you know, just going to go into the studio and, and, and fill in the rest. So the ovation is used heavily in that show. And therefore you hear that a lot on the record. And there's some other things that are used um, as well and that, that also you hear on the record. So it was not a like, conscious oh i need to like please the fans or like throw it back i mean like there's again there's really none of that because i can't like i just go with what feels good but that was um really to be kind of like a tool to talk about the the new touring show because again like we can't make money selling records so we need to tour but now i have the records yeah (laughs) but that's basically the the story um so if you were to go and see the show Data Not Found, in which, you know, I'm, I, have, I, I have lines and it's all very sort of hoity-toity, but I, <laughs> uh, one of the lines is, um, mo- you know, talking about modern yesterdays. So right that on. was a line from the show. And, um, you know, and, and I did not have any prediction that this album would be a standalone item. <laughs> right, <laughs> and, right and the on. only the only successful project of 2020 that I've created so far. Well, do you think that'll morph into the show when things come back in the future? Mike, I think that it's going to take a very, very long time to win back audiences in the way that we once did. So, I mean, I, and we can pontificate on the, on the, on the, on stuff about that. I mean, I think things will look different um, as soon as they can safely, but I, I'm not interested in, Going, I'm not interested in trying to resurrect something that should have been. I am mm. interested in moving forward. So I'm going to take what I have and figure out how to make the best of it. Um, well, I do hope that Data Not Found gets to tour. If it doesn't, I won't shed a tear. I'll just do something new the way I've always done. Well, that's that's something which has always been present in the way that you present yourself and everything you've done. Because from someone that's that's been aware of your music and, and the different things you've put out throughout the years... There's a lot of surprises in there, and, and even the, not the pre- all good. <laughs> not all good, Mike. Oh, I, I love it. I mean, you've gone from. I mean, people know you as a sort of guitar hero in, in the guitar scene, but but you're, you're you're one of the most. I really wanted to have you on this podcast because I think you're a really really interesting musician. From you know the, the more guitar based stuff at the beginning, then the multi instrumental stuff involving all kinds of crazy experiments, which we absolutely have to touch on. Then you went like punk rock. 
which was just freaking awesome. We can leave that part out. No, I love that record. And you, and, and you know, and then, and then anyway, uh, I want to touch on so many things with you, honest, honestly, it's going to be like just throwing shit at the wall. But, um, but you, you're no stranger to the sort of the theater side of things because you had uh, on the last tour I did in the States in North America, th- there were posters of you uh, on the walls of these theaters touring a show called The Neck is the Bridge to the Body, right? Yeah. Um, which was this kind of crazy audio visual experimental thing. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell people about that and, and how, how was that? Yeah. Did you, did you enjoy the process? Oh man, it's the neck. The neck is like, I, I, I love that show so much. So the neck is a bridge to the body was me attempting to do something different. Uh, someone had suggested, Oh, why don't you have a lighting designer at your shows and I was like what is that and I instead of having a lighting designer I was like why don't I do the like craziest thing possible so I painted a guitar white eventually had the sort of you know a couple guitars made for me and they uh I projection mapped onto the guitar and it was on stand so it was not moving and I played it and I so basically the uh the guitar became the musical producer of the soundtrack of the movie that you were watching play out on the guitar. There's lots of levels. And then the most exciting thing, which I think is still something I'm very uh, steeped in right at the moment is that I was controlling what you could see um, by, through playing. And it sounds sort of wild, but it's, it's quite simple once you sort of know the steps and um you know, so I could play a note and it would trigger a video clip and that, what you know, so I had this totally new language to speak. Um, and I'm not a real visual person. I never have been. I've always learned through my, through, through memory, through my ears. I've, I've never really, I can't really read something and remember it, but if you tell me, I'll remember it. And um, so visual stuff is totally brand new, but um, the neck is, the neck is rich to the body. The, the true, like the thing that happened that I didn't expect was that instead of just experimenting with, you know, again, like how can I push the guitar forward? What can, what's, what's the, you know, what's the, the shelf of the capacity of this type of experimentation? It changed me into someone who was suddenly a character in a show that I didn't know I had created for my, I didn't know I'd created this character. Well, I mean, you went suddenly, in on it because you, you dyed yeah. your hair and everything. You oh, changed your whole appearance oh, for this thing. Listen, full commitment. Absolutely. I mean, I did dye my hair, but I was overdue for a new hairstyle. But okay. yeah, so I had like like wall white hair and like this white outfit, these white sunglasses. Even the sunglasses were just because the projector was like, you know, screaming in my eyes. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I yeah, can imagine how hard that would be. The sunglasses weren't even like intentional until they became, you know, part of the look. But the character that I was playing was really this like, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know what's happening. But I do know that when the guitar needs me, I play it. And that's kind of like a metaphor for my existence. So that show ended up, you know, we started off in the same clubs and, you know, normal kind of kind of music scene yeah. places. And then um, a new agent started to say, listen, this needs to be in theaters and, and performing arts centers and all these places. Where you could really, really fine tune every single detail exactly as you want it. And it can be the hmm. same way every single night um and that is when it really took off and became something that i was like i like this i like the precision i I mean normally i'm very chaotic and i don't care and i'm like i don't whatever i don't need a monitor whatever just put me in i'll be fine but this was different this was sort of me being able to like give the audience this very very different presentation Um, but because I was motionless practically and totally mute and not communicating, I, I like, I missed that. Um, of course, because if, if you're you're projection mapping lights to your guitar, you've got to be quite robotic in how you're doing the whole show, right? Well, fortunately we, we managed to have a way that the guitar could sit on stands, Mm. but no, I can't like run around and dance around. and And it was sort of breaking, breaking this, this character, um, where you're really not supposed to be interested in me. You're supposed to be interested in the guitar and what the guitar's doing. At any rate, it had such success that I did not at all anticipate. It ran five, I toured it for five years. It was like, it got me through the birth of my two children and, you know, like the, the financial stuff around all of that. And it, it, it turned me into someone who was really interested in theater 
And again, interested in like being able to dial in things that are incredibly precise and, um, you know, lighting and sound design and, and, and working with media. And that's kind of where my world would be if we were right. Not- so you caught the bug for the next project from that project and the success of it. That's that's amazing. Definitely. Because I, I would have loved to have seen that show because you know I was aware of it when you you launched a few things on YouTube and I thought, wow, that's a really interesting project. And and I'm not someone who dabbles in visuals much at all because I'm colorblind actually as well. Oh really? So so not that that's an excuse. I use that as an excuse for if any of my like graphics well, are really it's poorly designed. But it's yeah, it's a psychological barrier to committing to something visual, right? Without yeah. the feedback of a professional, right? So um, and I was actually talking to Newton Faulkner. Um, I don't know if you, you you've, you've ever met him, but um, he's haven't. he's done a, a sort of similar process to you in the sense of of starting solo guitar and and building into this sort of um you know multifaceted multimedia kind of kind of thing and cool. and it was interesting hearing you talk about you know how how the whole thing with 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 the neck stuff came together when you know if the audience understands the steps they can kind of be be absorbed by it and and when i was talking to to, to newton we were saying that you know it, it's we put ourselves under this immense pressure sometimes to sort of, you know, trigger this thing with this foot and trigger an organ with this foot and, you know, rub our, you know, stomach mm-hmm. and pat our head at the same time and for maybe 2% of the audience to understand what's going on. And I think what... Oh what my the, God, oh my God. It's, it's the whole who pushes the button thing. Right, right? exactly. And, and uh, oh, uh, that was a wonderful performance by 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 the loop station, you know, um, <laughs> that, that, that old thing. But... Um, but yeah, and that's why I thought that the neck was such an interesting project because it didn't require a lot of commitment of understanding from the audience perspective to fully get everything that you were putting out there. You know what I mean? It was yeah. conceptually it was quite easy for somebody to to understand going into the show. Yeah, and I think that, you know, and I and I I I totally hear you in this whole like why does it matter that the guitar triggers this? Does it matter right. that it's me and not that guy behind the, the curtain? But I think that there, you 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 walk you toe that line and you realize that there are certain things that feel more live and they feel more reactive, and those are the kinds of things that work in that you know when you're triggering something. And if it literally could be done just as well and have just as good of a feeling by your audio or visual tech somewhere off in the distance, then just let him do it because you're right. 2% of the audience even remotely cares or has the interest. And that's really, you know, you're not, I'm not really on stage to give people technical information. Right. I'm there to give them a, an experience that t- like takes them away from that kind of thinking, like, yeah. you know, turns their brain off for a minute and knocks something loose that they need um, that isn't like, oh, I wonder if she's using a uh, Isadora or a Resolute. I mean, like th- those are not artistic questions to answer, you know, but like what is, what is, you know, hurting my soul is what I want people to be able to answer. Absolutely. And this is a, this is a reason why I feel quite, so, so I've only ever really performed as a sort of one guitar and pedals and shtick, right? <laughs> um, and 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 the shtick is a, is a big part of it because when you're up there by yourself, you have to do that, right? And, oh, and you got it. You're and you know I've seen a couple of videos of you, and you're really good at shtick. And you know what's funny about you is that there's there's really two types of guitar players. There are people who are taking themselves very seriously, and then there's like you, and then there's you and me who like look like we're taking ourselves seriously, but are genuinely like. I don't know what the fuck's going on. This oh, is crazy. My God. Look at, look at, and like, I think that we are both, we have a, like some self-awareness about how cringy certain oh, things yeah. that we do are. Power stunts, <laughs> you know? <laughs> We're like, I'm going to do this thing. It's sort of terrible. But I'm going to do it anyway. Well, that's <laughs> what I was trying to get to is, is, you know, <laughs> it's all, you know, uh, when you're up there by yourself, you know, you can make the conscious decision to just not really give a fuck if something goes wrong, you know, to yeah. an extent. I mean, you don't want to give oh, people yeah. a bad show, but, you know, something I always tell people in, in workshops all the time is, you know, they'll be sweating about all this stuff. And, and yes, of course, you need to practice and of course you need to play tight. But if something goes wrong, don't freak out. Like, like if you break a string, no one, oh, you, you know what I mean? Just change the string and and make a bad joke and tell a story and don't sweat know, and don't and worry the thing and is that people don't realize about how 
like when shit goes wrong, the audience is that's like so the best thing there for you. Exactly. Like, oh my god, I feel for you. You're gonna get through this, buddy. It's gonna be okay. And the more like, and I, you know, to, to piggyback on the giving advice, it's like I have had every possible calamity happen to me that could. I really think that I have maybe set the record for like oh, yeah? guitars breaking, strings breaking, sound going out you know, lights going out, fire extinguisher blowing up in backstage. Wow. My dog ran on stage once. I had never traveled. That was the end of that. <laughs> so, and just like, but just in the, just in generally just cringe saying cringy, embarrassing things that I regretted as I was saying them. Oh yeah. And I think that there is nothing that you cannot recover from. And I think that like it, it's, it's taken a lifetime of being on stage clearly, but there's just, I, I feel almost impervious to embarrassment at this moment because it's all happened. And it's all out there like, and it's all on YouTube here, at this point. I'm, I'm fine. It yeah. didn't kill me. It didn't destroy my career. It was just a thing. You just have to move on. And like at the time, I'll admit, certain things were like, this is horrible. <laughs> I, I, well, I couldn't wish for death more than in this moment. But it really, it's like, I feel like it's it's my strength because at this point... Whatever happens, happens, and I am cool as a cucumber. Well, so, you yeah, know, I, I, I think, think it was, yeah, I think it was one of, um, I, I saw a bootleg video of you breaking a string really early on in the YouTube days. Just some, something, and, and this, actually, I recall watching, and, and something, this was when I was maybe 17 or something, and I just realized, oh, you're allowed to break a string. No one actually cares. Like, no just cares. tell a story, you know, and, and... There's, there's a, it, it takes, um, in my experience anyway, just seeing somebody who is a professional, um, just something go wrong, you can, you accept that and you move on and then, and then it does help you realize that. So I, I'd really implore anyone listening to this, just it's okay if something goes wrong. I mean, I've seen the biggest professional arena oh, act yeah. play and something will go wrong with their pedals or a nine volt battery will oh die. No one cares. Yeah, but 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 going uh, t- going back to your sort of body of work and, and and stuff like that, maybe taking it back to that kind of era when YouTube first started, and I was first sort of seeing players like yourself and being aware of that. One of the first things I saw of you was, I think it was on David Letterman. Mm, yeah, you, 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 and, and I can't think of any instrumental sort of acoustic guitar player to do that yeah. kind of late night show. I mean, how did that come about? And how was that experience? You know, it was very, it, I, I had done Conan O'Brien and then I, and then I did Letterman and I, I can't remember what they were saying, but I mean, really at the time it was so, there, there was no instrumental music being played on late night. And yeah. I think I had a combination of, you know, sort of like I had, I had no self-awareness and the only, well, I can, I can tell you a story about Letterman, but I don't know how it happened. I was lucky enough, like the beginning of my career was very, very fortunate. I did not, I kind of fell into it and I fell into a group of, of talented you know, managers and PR people that weren't assholes. Um, and so all of this was kind of being done for me in terms of the connections and the whatever. Um, but someone did have to say yes. Like someone did have to say, yes, I want her on David Letterman and, yeah. and I want her on Conan O'Brien. And that was, I mean, that was really, that was, that was when I was like, oh, whoa, this is what? So, <laughs> but, but the thing about, the thing about David Letterman show, which is of course not on the air and probably half, half of the listeners who are younger than 30 are like, what, who, but, um, he kept his studio so cold. I'm telling oh, you, it's no. so, and it's, and it's, the it's, like it's one of these things where people warn you and you're like, oh, please, what a baby. But then you watch and you're like, wow, like half the performers on the show are in coats. I mean, it is fucking freezing. So the only like mentally you go in and you're like, I'm going to play for this huge lot audience. It's going to be worldwide. And none of that happens. You're like, I am going to crash and burn because none of my muscles have any blood in them oh gosh and is, <laughs> is it a one take is a one take thing no no no. i mean listen they do not they are not fans of having to retake yeah on any of these shows because they, they take multiple shows a day they just they got to keep things rolling and moving but i mean it is 
And I think that's kind of the saving part about some of these things is that when you go into them, you are so you start off thinking like this will be this is going to change my life. And then you mm. really just focus on like, I just can't snap the G string. I just don't want to snap the G string. It's too free. <laughs> <laughs> and they want you to keep your instrument. They've learned, keep your instrument on stage. So I didn't bring a backup guitar because that was dumb. And so I like, you know, go out to my guitar, which is now like 40 degrees. Oh, I feel, I feel your pain so much. So, you know, but, but, in, but it really, it was so nice to have that to worry about and not everything else that I could have been thinking at the time. And, and were you stoked by the response and did it change things for you? You know, that is a hard thing to measure. It certainly, I will say that for the first 10 years of my career, it was probably one of the best names to drop. Right, you know, okay. it legitimized things for me. And I think, frankly, for a lot of other people, like for acoustic guitar players to be like, wait, I mean, you know how it is. It's like, wait, you play guitar. Wait, you don't sing. I don't understand. Oh, it's yeah. like, you know, but to have, but just to say that and be like, but she was on Letterman. It's somehow like the, the mental gymnastics of that makes sense to people like well, oh, be, that. Being, yeah i mean it's it, it's very easy to get legitimized to non-music uh obsessives by a household name well hello there everyone apologies for the interruption to the podcast but i did want to tell you about the amazing tonewood amp the awesome sponsors of the show many of you will know already that i use this thing all the time the magical little device that sticks with magnets to the back of your acoustic guitar vibrates the back surface of the instrument so that reverb delay chorus leslie speaker effects and other loveliness project out of the sound hole as if by magic you're a wizard i'm a what you can head to mike doors has a podcast podcast.com now to get more information about the Tonewood amp as well as saving a tasty percentage for yourself. Let's get right back to it. You know, and, and I experienced a similar thing when I went from playing just my thing to getting a session gig with um, a guy called Justin Hayward, who's the front man of a band called the Moody Blues. And nice. everybody, everybody's like, it's like everyone's mum's favorite band, right? Everyone's uh, mum's favorite, everyone's band, mom's yeah. favorite band, right? So including my aunt. And suddenly... <laughs> The bum musician of the family, you know, the bum musician of the family had a real job now, you know, even though we're playing, the, you know, we're playing the similar kind of circuits. And, you know, admittedly, it was my first time in America and, and and I still play with Justin to this day. I get to open the shows as well. So it's a double whammy. It's the dream gig. But um, it was really interesting how, you know, you could be making a living for years doing something obscure like instrumental guitar but it just takes the household name to kind of make the aunt and uncle pat you on the back a little, oh, <laughs> a little bit God. you know you know well, I, I think i think certain things like that it's like and only it, it's almost like you only need one you know you don't need like it's like one tv show sync or one you know movie sync or one like <clears throat> one big cultural reference point that everyone can agree that exists and suddenly you are not as weird as we thought you were. Right. Well, you and, you certainly have a lot of those. And I do. I, I mean, do. Well, I started to accumulate them, which was which was also fascinating because, you know, again, like my career was happening to me, whether I liked it or not. Often I kind of felt I was and I was just like, well, I'm going to go and keep doing this until I'm not. It's not a thing that I'm doing anymore. And there were always gigs being put on the calendar and then there was another record and there was another record and there was more gigs and it just was, it just kept happening. And I was like, my God, I really wanted to go to grad school, but I guess, I guess not. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I mean, and uh, speaking of these, these other kind of more mainstream things that you've done, there have been some, some movies and things like that. I mean, uh, constantly yeah. on YouTube, on almost every video I've ever done, someone will comment August rush, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure on every video you've done as well. And is that something that, that, I mean, surely you must be stoked to be in this movie with Robin Williams, right? The late great. How was that? <laughs> like, would you like a story for your podcast? Oh, oh yeah. Um, just give me a soundbite, you know. <laughs> um, they, they made the movie and I thought they did a really good job. <clears throat> they had called David Crosby. Oh. That David Crosby and said, we need a guitar song, like a cool, crazy, interesting technique for this little boy. And David Crosby says, look no further than Michael Hedges. 
he is, he was the, you know, the, the, the guy and the inventor and the originator. And they were good friends, Crosby and, and Hedges. Mm. So they pick a Michael Hedges song, which Freddie Highmore, the actor in the movie, successfully plays. So they bring me this movie and I'm in, I'm in Los, this is like a moment for me. Okay. I'm in Los Angeles on a tour bus <laughs> and um, yes. which was, does not always happen. And actually it's almost never happened. But at the time it felt very cool for these Hollywood producers to be coming on my tour bus with their movie. And they were like, so they showed me the movie and I was like, this looks great. Like I see no problem. They're like, nah, it doesn't look good enough. And the trouble was they had picked a Hedges song that really was just traditional strumming. There isn't much about rich. Um, oh my God. Is it rich? It dance? Rich dance. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That, that goes beyond that goes into extended technique. So even though the song is a total jam and Love in a it. different tuning, it's just, it looks sort of calm, like a more traditional technique. So they're like, mm, can you, so anyway, they went back to David Crosby and David Crosby said, well, if you, <laughs> if you need someone who can play like hedges, but is alive, you should ask Kaki King. And so they literally came to me and were like, can you change this song? and re-record it and add some things that look better. And then can you get into this little boy's costume and be the handbag? <laughs> and I was like, yes, that all awesome. sounds sane and normal and not crazy and not unethical and not against like things that make me feel really uncomfortable. I was like, sure. No, it was a tough, it was a tough decision. Cause it felt like, I felt like I just shat all over Michael Hedges' song to make oh, it look good for not, Hollywood. That's not how it came across at all. I mean, that well, was my... I, know, uh, I think at the end of the day, I spoke to enough people that were like, oh, please, he would just, yeah, don't, like, please don't worry yourself about being haunted by him. Um, he would think this is hilarious. So, uh, but that's how that gig came about. It was not exactly like they said, oh, can you come and do this thing? It was like, we fucked up, can you fix it? Well, you know what's funny is I can relate to that in a very, in a much smaller way in that the, I did a TV advert, right, years ago, and it was a similar thing of, you know, we need you to write, it was, um, I had to write a guitar battle, right, and they wanted it on acoustic guitars and they wanted to do all kinds of techniques and all this kind of, this was 2013, so, you know, seven years or so since, you know, you had people like yourself, Drifting, Andy McKee, you know, the public consciousness was slightly more aware of the style. So I did it and I, I did this guitar battle and I had to kind of make it, I decided to make it like a homage to my favorite players in the scene. So it would be, you know, a couple of bars of one guy, a couple of bars of the other back and forth. And there'd be some sort of Preston Reed over the top stuff, you know, and, and oh, like, yeah. like yourself. And, but um, first of all, I had to get CG'd as an old man. So they they brought what? me into this oh studio God. and with the with the dots the mo you know oh, the ping pong balls awesome. and yeah so so I've erased it from the internet but it's um I'm a little like CG old man that's about four foot tall and um and the other guy who I was playing with I, he, he had to look at my chest for the eye contact because we put little ping pong ball eyes on my chest because that's how <laughs> you know but they managed to replicate my guitar perfectly that's the weird thing like they took all these photos of my Nick Benjamin guitar and it's bang on accurate but what happened again it was like should i do this should i not like is this and i'm like oh it's pretty hilarious that this kind of weird niche guitar style is going to be on like a national tv ad and and then like one of the guitar players who i kind of homaged was furious i won't name what? any names but furious and and you know was like sending me all this hate mail and like Ooh. yeah it was That's it was weird. pretty bad so i ended up just being like i'm I'm so sorry. Like, uh, if you want, what do you want money? I mean, I, d I don't know what to say. So I just said, I'm going to be literally in your town in like, like next month on tour. Just meet me if you want. And I'll just give you some money. I, I, I was like 23 years old. I don't know what, uh, you know uh, what I mean? And, and yeah. fortunately, fortunately, the whole thing kind of, kind of dissipated and, and that conversation kind of stopped. But it's a very real thing to consider when you put yourself out there in that kind of mainstream media and have the people who are in your little indie community kind of 
turn their nose up at that a little bit. And 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 what what was intended to be a homage was you know by by one person taken as an almost an insult, you know. And but 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 with the August Rush thing, I mean, honestly, I've I would never even consider that anyone would have any kind of issue with that. I mean, the, you you are one of the players who have helped elevate this style of playing into a open market where other players can actually come and play in venues now you know because it's it, it's it's a crazy yeah. thing and um well and you know what the, the, what you mentioned it goes to a sort of a, a, a weirder deeper issue and i think in the guitar community which i frankly you know i didn't really know we can talk about the scene and who knows who and what and what but like i just didn't have any ability to connect because i was like yeah, I did this. And suddenly I was like, you know, playing in the subway and a year later, later I was playing on national television. And then it just got so crazy so quickly. Um, but I have been shocked, shocked at how many times people have not been uh, awesome and supportive and, and encouraging and cool. I have been so shocked it when young guitar players tell me like oh yeah that guy was a dick to me or that guy was like it happened it happened to me too personally like and it was sort of ugly in this in a similar way like I, no no one will be named but instead of someone being like wow thanks for being cool and talking about me as an influence and like what you know what's up it was like here's here's a letter from my lawyer whoa demanding you know publishing and whatever it was just st stuff like that but it's really weird when there's this territorial feeling like this is not an, in, this is this world. Can, there can only be one or there can only be a couple of people. It's like if everyone were playing this in this way, and if we had all this knowledge and all this support and love, then like we like a, the rising tide would float us all. And yeah. instead constantly I hear like, Oh yeah. Well, like, you know, you're ripping off that guy or that just sounds like this person or that new kid is, you know, overhyped. And it's never just like, hey, 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 like, why don't we just I mean, like, you know, Candy Rat's done a really good job of sort of being like, we're all playing guitar and it all is good. Yeah. Um, Shout out to Candy Rat. There have been a lot of instances where, you know, I, I, I hear where it's like where someone in, you know, it happened to me at about the same age, Mike, and we can speak privately about it. <laughs> but it's really strange if someone like if some young person and it does happen often where some young person comes and they're like playing like me and they are like, I love your style. And I, I learned how to play this song and it led me to write this song. I'm like, dude, that is so fucking cool. That's so, so cool. And keep it up. And it's weird when the like strange, uh, when there's people are creating this, hierarchy where there is none and a um almost like a system of like a, like like ranking and um also when people are just being like you know there's no room for you here because well that exists it, yeah it, it exists more now than i think it has because there is a, a lot of younger people see that there is a hierarchy in the form of freaking followers and likes and that didn't used to be a no, thing well, when yeah. when, when that, you started and, the and when that is like every every like you know teenager with like a guitar is going to have more like clicks and likes than i am because i'm you know still dealing with diapers and stuff um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I can understand how older people would be like, that's very threatening to me. That feels mm. like that's going to take up, you know, space with, with it, that, that, that person's going to steal my audience when it couldn't be more further from the truth. It's going to introduce more pe people to your work exactly. and we're going to all do better. And every, every sort of few years, I see another sort of younger player coming through and they're just absolutely mind blowing. And, and, and if they cite you as an influence, it's a super, super humbling yeah, thing. It's amazing. But, but, but you end up with more followers at the end of the day, more fans, because they'll talk about you in an interview or, or just, just piece up, they'll be someone else's gateway into the genre, you know? Yeah, exactly. There you go. And another thing is, you know, talking about the neck as a bridge to the body, right? That was a theater show that ran or became a big theater show that ran for you, say, five years. You know. Yeah, I toured it for, I mean, yeah, I toured this, it for that long. But this isn't a video with kittens in, and you, you know, you know what I mean? Like, this is a different, this is a real boots on the ground event with right, people yes. coming and buying tickets and coming to a show. And, 
and I would really like to to share with anyone who's sort of coming up and playing now and, and maybe f- getting a bit of anxiety or feeling a bit depressed about their their social media or something so arbitrary as social media. The real touring circuit, to a very valid extent, doesn't really give a shit about your you know your social media followers versus another guitar player. If you're presenting Dream a great leader. show and a great art piece and and you go and do a great job and you get the standing ovation and then the next year you come back and then the audience comes back and brings their friends, that is a very real thing. And I feel like that is not represented in how most people consume media, especially in 2020 when that's you know the opposite is all we have, right? Um, yeah. But it is it's really I just want to all I always want to echo that point to people because I get a lot of messages actually from people that are just they're thinking of quitting music because they're not getting enough likes which is such a dumb freaking concept I you know, know. Yeah. um and 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 it's really really nice to hear you say things like you've just created this artistic show involving you know the the bleached hair and the costume and the light projections and all that stuff and it becomes this sort of theater phenomenon in north america right mm-hmm. um really 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 cool um yes yeah, so something else i actually wanted to to touch on to sort of veer things into, uh, I guess, uh, I guess, following on from the whole slight mainstream stuff that you've done, is I I, I just remembered the other day when we you know, confirmed we were doing this that you are a Foo Fighters song. What? <laughs> the f- like, like you're not you're not on oh you're not on a Foo Fighters song. You are a Foo Fighters song. You know what I mean? Like what? What? Wait, what? Like you're, you are, you're. There's a Foo Fighters song which I listen to, and it's yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's me playing. Yeah, but you're. Yeah. Th- that's it. It's just. It's not like. No, it's me. It's it's me and Dave Grohl. Oh, you both. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was two oh, yous. Yeah. This, this story is so good. So, oh god. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> I start getting messages from this dude named Dave. And My he's buddy like Dave Grohl. Absolutely Grohl. out of his mind. Um. And he's like, we got to make a band together. It's going to call it, we're going to call it the Star Spangled Ash Shredders. And I'm like, please leave. It just, I just didn't know what the <laughs> fuck he's talking about. And he cut, he, you know, he was basically like, we're, we're fans. Like we watch your shit. It's amazing. And I'm like, that is, that is so cool coming from you. And, and the Foo Fighters is a, you know, it's a four piece, but it's really sort of an eight piece. And it's mm. really this family. Um, of of musicians and and techs and everything, so they're making this album and and Dave's like, I want you to play on the album, and it was just, it was very vague what was happening. But I'm in Los Angeles again, um, of course, and he's like, Yeah, come over, like come over to the to the studio, and uh, so we were listening. They're mixing the album, and he's like, I want to play the song, and I was like, Okay, I'm thinking they're gonna like re- play a recorded piece of music he's like no i gotta i gotta play this so he goes and gets a guitar and he's like playing me this little riff he's like listen these miners were trapped in a mine in tasmania and they wanted they want like you know they could get stuff to the miners they couldn't get them out and one of the things the miners wanted in addition to food and water was ipods with Foo fighters records so like crazy wow and he says you know but he, he's like so i promised these guys when i was drunk at this bar that i put a song from them on the record That's <laughs> and he's awesome. like, so you need to help me <laughs> <laughs> what have i done <laughs> <laughs> i mean he was very genuine but he was also like what how does one do that exactly well he so really he dug himself a hole pun intended yeah uh, Where- that was good so he uh he played, he started, picked up a guitar, started playing me a riff. So I do what I do. I picked up another guitar and I played a riff on top of it. And it was a simple bluegrass kind of sound. And um, it was almost like a slowed down banjo vibe. Yeah. And he said, oh, this is great. Okay, cool. So come tomorrow and we'll record this. And they have this like warehouse of a studio storage rehearsal. Is this in, is studio, studio City, is it? Is it in Studio City? Um, it was, it's... Some the time it was mega maybe thing. Ventura, I don't know. I can't right. remember. Anyway, so I go out and we like, and it's you know this cavernous type of space with multiple plate. I mean, they, I'm sure they've made videos and stuff in there. Anyway, so like, <laughs> it's just me and him, you know, just two guitars, and we just did a couple takes, and like that's what's on the record. Amazing. 
after that, he said, well, since you've done this and since we're touring Australia where the miners are, why don't you come and play on the tour? So I opened the Foo Fighters tour and I'm saying when you listen and again, not all opening acts are created equal. They're almost all terrible. Even when you're opening for a giant band in the stadium, they like, it's like six o'clock in the evening. They turn on the lights, they open the doors and you have to play. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it's oh, like I've been there. very yeah, yeah. unimpactful. But then, I mean, he would bring me on stage in front of thousands and thousands and thousands of people every night and introduce me. And then we would, and he'd tell the story and he'd, we'd play the tune. And it was just like. That's amazing. Yeah. It's a pity I don't remember any of that because I was drinking so much. Well, that means that you had fun. <laughs> and that's the most important thing, right? I Get out. I people told me I had a lot of fun. Okay, excellent. Well, yeah, it's uh, that. it reminds me of... Um, uh, Andy McKee going out with Prince in Australia. Amazing. Uh, what right? a crazy gig, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But but the whole, yeah, opening act being uh, pretty unglamorous. I remember I did a one of these uh, cruise festivals. You know, there's all these like rock festivals on cruise ships that depart from Miami and go around there. And, and um, one, yeah. I'm already like getting nervous. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, y you know when they say your set's on the pool deck? <laughs> for the kind of music that we're playing it's it's not the best but i i remember my my pool deck set got rained off and i was just like thank you i still get yeah. like i still get paid but i don't have to do the <laughs> the the pool deck because you know it's just yeah. not for anyone listening who isn't like into acoustic guitar live sound just you don't want to be on the pool deck right um, it, it's just a nightmare deck. but i got to i managed to sweet talk my way into an opening set for uh the orchestra which is like elo but like the other one when they kind of mm -hmm. forked and it's in the big theater, right? So the big, you know, I don't know how many, what the capacity is, but most of the ship can get into that room. Right. Um, and they were like, okay, sure. Uh, you can play, but you've got a half an hour set and that includes sound check and setup. So, <laughs> so I was like, fine, no problem. Pedal board, run up, dump it on yeah. the floor, plug in, level's good. Hey guys, welcome, you know, bish bash bosh. And thankfully uh, the, the sound guy was good, but but there is, there's been some times, man. I mean, I mean, one one of my first shows, it was like that. The, you break a nail in the first song. The feedback, oh, yeah. the, the fire alarm goes off. One <laughs> gig. So, so this is not meant to sound disrespectful if if anyone's listening. But one gig, um, I'm not gonna say where it is or who it was. But somebody died. Oh shit, Mike! Yeah. You're cursed. I, I mean, like literally. I mean, I, I, I know, I've, I probably, I don't know if it's appropriate to share this or not, but I guess we can't really go back from it now. But Someone literally, it was a standing ovation, kind of clap, and they had a heart attack. And I was in getting in the earpiece, like, you know, from Steve at front of house, like, call for a doctor. And I was, I had no idea what was going on. And I was like, is there a doctor? You know, and it, this this whole thing cra Whoa, went crazy. That's yeah. That's really heavy, man. I'm that's, sorry that happened to you. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry for for the for the person, but um, but there's been some more entertaining things that have gone wrong as well. Like somebody pooped themselves, um, you know, which is the best of us. Yeah, but then they walked up, then it went all on the snake. You know, the the, the snake that the sound guys put the cable on, and it was just this hazmat kind of <laughs> kind of thing. What oh, about you, no. Kaki? What What about your 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 horrible tour stories? You must have a a, a specific thing in mind. Seeing as you've done so many shows. My horrible tour stories are, are I mean, the horrible parts are mainly sort of me being horrible um, <laughs> in one way or another. But it, like I like I kind of said early on, you know, there have been so many moments of just total. Yeah, like I've had nails fly off into the audience. I've had to stop the show so the audience can search for my nail that I then have to glue back onto my body. I mean, you know, gross. Oh, God. That's probably the grossest. Um, I've got something that'll top that, by the way. But yeah, so, so Excellent. I mean, I, 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 I left stage one time because I had some kind of norovirus and was puking and shitting. And Oh, my God. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I may I may have been, I, you know, I was like that close to dripping on the snake myself. <laughs> um, I've certainly, you know, you're, you're touring and touching all kinds of things. And, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I've definitely God, and I've had, I've, I have absolutely had. So with the neck, I am not actually on stage when the show starts. 
So again, this is a show that I toured for five years. Mm. And every time the show, the, the video and, and pre-record would happen. Yeah. And then I would come out and it's this whole th- sort of, you know, thing that was, was made sense of you looking at it. Um, and I can't see the audience at all. So I have no idea. So I have absolutely had this show that was loved and popular and well attended. Um, <laughs> like at the end of the show, the lights go on and there's like 13 people. I'm sorry, yeah, Ka- sorry, Kaki. I just lost you there. Yeah. Like you totally froze up. Could you um, just go back and tell that again? I'm so sorry. Where did where did you lose me? Um, uh, th- th- talking about the neck and not being on stage at the start of the show. Yeah. So uh, when the when this when the show starts, I don't I don't see the audience, and I don't see the audience until the very end. And you know, there's one time where. Um, I played a really great show and I gave it my all and like the, the lights came up and there was like 13 people in the audience. Whereas oh. the night before there had been, you know, 600 and I was like, alrighty then. And you know, the thing that I've also learned and we talk about opening at opening shows being dismal and this, yes, they are, they can be, but I think that more opportunity in my life has come from those weird tiny shows those really really weird like off the wall the agents like it's only gonna you're only gonna make like a few hundred bucks but otherwise you'd have a day off and don't you want to see finland and you know and you go and suddenly you literally it's life-changing whatever happens or whoever sees you or whatever it's like now i just i my rule is like don't turn it down unless i'm losing money if i can do it i should do it because that is so those true. So true. Oh my God. I can't tell you. And like, and it's like, that's kind of the legendary story of all stories. It's never like the more people you play in front of the better the, the, I mean, yeah. So the law of averages means yes, the more likely there is some kind of gatekeeper person, da, da, da. but a lot of those people, first of all, they're not even necessary anymore, but a lot of those moments um, where you like meet the person you're going to write a award-winning song with, or you, you know, see, you know, someone's like wandered into a, you know, jazz bar and you're playing in the corner and it's miserable. And they're like, you know, they're going to change your life. Or you just simply have an experience that, that you really, really love. There just isn't anything. There really isn't anything as a, you know, there, there's no such thing as a bad gig. Yeah, it's well, kind of just like, uh, oh, well, that didn't, that wasn't great. But I like played my instrument on stage, and and you know, I mean, it can be really to tough it out takes a lot of guts. But I just don't think there's, uh, you can make it what you make what what you do. But really, those small opportunities are so are usually they 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 yield a lot more dividends than the oh, I really snagged the big one here. That is so, I opened so for true. People for a year, my. I played in front of huge festivals, huge hippie festivals, jam bands. I opened for like, you know, big major players and, you know, like all kinds of stuff. And I played at giant venues and there were hundreds and hundreds of people. So yeah, like I sold some merchandise, but I don't think any of those has given me the sort of the, the, whatever the next step forward for me was, whether it was an idea or a, a, a someone I met or someone I heard those big things are not as, as valuable in the long run as like something, you know, some kind of, um, something that builds character. And I think built, you know, playing small shows where no one's listening is one of the most character building things you could do. Totally. And and also it's an interesting, it's something interesting I've learned from touring is sometimes I'll, I'll have a really great gig and I'll feel like I absolutely nailed it and everything was perfect and the vibe was great. And then the response to say, like, you know, one gauge of how well a show has been received, it's a bit of a superficial gauge, is is the merch, right? So say you play to a yeah, thousand absolutely. people on night one and a thousand people on night two. Night one, you feel like you absolutely crushed it and no one will buy any of your merch. And then night two, you're like, oh, oh my God, God, I'm shaking. I played so bad. And then everyone's just like, oh, that was the best thing ever. Um, and that's something else which which really helped me absorb how how to not feel like stressed or worried on stage because you never really can tell how it's going to be received by the audience. And I've really tried, I've really tried to figure out some kind of metric there. 
but it's an unpredictable thing. And that's what I really miss about, you know, missing touring is that every night is just unpredictable and every night is different and it's dangerous and it's real and it's tangible. And, and you know, like I've done one live streaming concert and I really enjoyed it. I actually played one of your songs. Oh, it. did you yeah. play the night of sidewalk? I did indeed. Yeah, oh, yeah. It was such a beautiful version of that. Oh well, it, it's yeah. I mean, I'm hoping to record it uh, one time, but it'll be it'll be nice on. Uh, yeah, well, it, I mean, I just love playing that song, but um, you know, it's not the same. The the live stream thing, I love it, but it's a different thing. It's a it's a different thing, but it is dangerous. It's more dangerous because you've got the tech, and I've got to like manage the camera and manage the audio and all of that stuff. Yeah. But um. But hey, something I, I just a, a slight tangent before we before we do wrap things up. I do really want to make sure that I've I've talked about the things that I as as just a goofy fan want to talk about, which is just all the crazy musical weirdness that you have done throughout your career. All the multi instrumental stuff, which I feel like the guitar community might not know as well because th- they might gravitate naturally yeah. towards the solo guitar stuff. Because your third album was was the album where that I totally fell in love with and it kind of kept me company on all these night drives after shows and things back when I was like 17 doing like playing in bars in like Essex and driving back to the West Country and stuff and then Dreaming of Revenge which was after that these two albums just just these two albums in particular for whatever reason just maybe I was like the target audience I don't know but they're just <laughs> there's something really magical about this and I haven't really heard anyone since within the the guitar community and I'm putting you in the guitar community loosely because I do think you've transcended that, you know, but th- there's something about this experimentation and, 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 and things that I really haven't heard replicated since. And I was just, just wondering, you know, it's a big question to say what was going through your mind when you did that, like what made you experiment with, you know, I think you, you had some cereal in a bowl or something and recorded that. I, uh, I think I saw it. All kinds of crazy yeah. stuff. I mean, could you talk a little bit about those two records and and, and yeah, there's something so different the going on? Yeah, first one was, was called Until We Felt Red. Um, I had done two successful solo guitar uh, albums. And I knew, I just didn't have another one in me at the time. Like, I and I don't think it would have served me well to do a third acoustic guitar record. I just... And again, a lot of these things are not up to me. They're up to like the muse or the frustrating point of creation that I can't seem to control. But um, I really was a fan of of post rock, and I really liked Tortoise and Cian Cake and uh, John McIntyre, who is the drummer and producer of those bands, including you know many 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 other records he's done. Um, I thought, you know, this is a person I want to work with. And my pattern for all the records I've ever done, except for the first one, has been to it myself um, and a producer engineer. And then I play as many, you know, as much instrumentation as I can. And then, you know, hire people to, to take over um, what I can't do. But that's kind right. of the pattern. It's like me working in, you know, communion with <clears throat> one other person. And... Um, yeah, I just was, I was trying stuff. I, um, definitely wanted a sort of bigger sound and I wanted to sing and I wanted to, you know, and also a lot of these songs were already written for some reason. So I just okay. wanted to put them down. Um, and I wanted to, you know, and it was nice cause still, that was still in a time where it made enough sense for me to like go to Chicago, rent a little apartment you know, like work in this studio, it was dead of winter, it was fucking cold. Um, so that kind of, you know, total lack of distraction was really helpful. And then in um, Dreaming of Revenge, which I think is a probably, you know, epitomizing that kind of style where there's sort of some, some singing, some vibes, but it's a lot of just really solid instrumental stuff. Um, you know, that was done <clears throat> with Malcolm Byrne similar experience. I was living in, in his giant Victorian house in Kingston, New York. Um, and he had the studio in the basement and that was sort of what we would do all day. And so a lot of what you're hearing is not, you know, like I didn't walk in with a band and this is how we played the song. So I was right. inventing how these songs were going to be played. And, and Malcolm was even a lot, he really helped me a lot because he was like, you don't need to know what you're you don't need to know what you're doing. And like for, as a solo guitar player, we're always like, I need this to be perfect. So I don't spend, you know, 10 hours on one take. 
he, he was like, throw all of this away and let's just write some stuff and let's figure out what we're doing. And so that's, that's really um, interesting. That's really interesting to me with the, that sort of 2020 head on where when someone thinks of a, a multi-instrumental record, they think of a door and they think of playing around with MIDI and writing it all out in logic or something like this. Whereas you, yeah, which, uh, is, which is, which is fine. And that's, and that's know, a totally valid tool, but, totally but fine too. I mean, it, it just happened to be that, that, you know, I think that it was like, it was a matter of just not wasting too much time of like, you know, figuring out a melody and then committing to it and just make, this is the melody. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to have a lot of uh, debate here over mm. whether or not this works or if like, if it sounds good, it works, we're going to do it and move on. And I think that was really helpful. So um, we did a lot of doubling and tripling of instruments. You can't really tell what is being played at any given time for certain melodies. I played a lot of drums. I played a lot of drums on both those records, but definitely on Dreaming of Revenge. Um, that was probably the peak of my like, you know, ability to, to, really whack on a drum kit and the pedal steel so there wasn't as well. a what's that the pedal steel stuff oh yeah I played pedal steel played a lot of lap steel i was super into lap steel at the time um yeah so i was kind of i was i was exploring what was possible and then you know the touring reflected that i had like, like a small ensemble and then i went up to like a quintet at some point and you know there was definitely different experiments with all with all of that stuff you know and i think mike that you know i kept it all it was all still on the guitar you know the guitar i wasn't playing a non-stringed instrument and i was just trying to again just like trying to find what was possible and what what there was to do those tours were a lot of fun like they were a yeah. lot of fun getting out there and playing really loud with great i had great 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 drummers they were all you know coming from like broadway and they could basically, you know, play circles around anyone. It was so, it was awesome, you know? And then when it was time to put that away, I put it away too. I did three, three records with ensembles and, you know, the last one was totally insane. Um, and the tours were very weird. And I came back from Europe to go straight to Jimmy Fallon and played with the roots. And I mean, it was, you know, like, this is, this is, this is junior you're talking about. Yeah. 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 That one I love. I love that. I, 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 you, you, you made the same expression when we talked about it earlier. But please go, go and listen to Junior you know, on Spotify, everyone. It's, it's a great record. So much more about where I was in my life than with the content of that album. And I think that, you know. Uh, anyway, we won't going to get into it. But I love it. I love know, it. It exists, and some people, a lot of people, love it. They freaking love it, and they think it's like some of my best work. And I listen back, and I'm like, yeah. I mean, I was on an interesting tip. That was a, that was a choice I made. And, um, and then I turned 30 and I was like, do I want to do this anymore? It's starting to get sing. I'm old one now. Um, but career is going to start to close. Do I want to consider, you know, doing something else with the rest of my life? I've had a very interesting run and glow, which was a record and came out in 2012 was basically like, no, 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 no. No, no, no. I'm the guitar and I tell you what to do. That not the opposite. <laughs> oh, right. So okay. I wrote a bunch of really good guitar songs and recorded them and I did a, again sort of a new thing. And that was also a lot of other instrumentation. Introduce but introduce the world to the uh to the harpeggi as well. The harpeggi was if on that. That's how you pronounce it, yeah. Uh I think harpeggi, yeah. And you know, that that was kind of that. That was really the end of my ability to 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 pivot at that point. And do something else with my life, which damn, had I known that we'd have this pandemic, I might have picked up a few more skills. But hindsight's 2020. Yeah, there we go. That's that that wins the humor points for this this podcast. I think we made I think we got so many good dad jokes in, we should send each other Father's Day cards. Absolutely. Well, one day we'll meet up in real life when this is over know, and, uh, and make so uh, make real horrible dad jokes, which is great because as an Englishman, like I do that all the time, constantly, that's and it's annoying. Funny, oh, it's The only jokes you have are, are, are dad jokes. Exactly. And it's important to laugh during this, this 
kind of ridiculous year. Well, Kaki King, it's been so cool to talk to you and 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 oh, really really wicked to kind of uh, yeah for, for my own little nostalgia trip as well, going back and talking about those records, which was so important in, in my development. And I really implore anyone listening to to check out the whole discography. So, just to wrap things up for anyone uh, listening who perhaps maybe hasn't heard your stuff before, which three Khaki King tracks should they te- check out on uh, oh, online? Track? Your top, your your top three tracks of your own, which is a horrible thing to well, that's ask. The worst thing. I know. Ever. I know. You know what? We are no longer friends. Our friendship has now ended. I thought sorry. there was some promise, but you have you have <laughs> really just done the worst thing you could do to a person. To- having a, a solo guitarist talk themselves up by asking for a top tracks is really I understand how cringy okay, that my, is, but I'm, I've done it now. My current bop is a song on modern yesterdays which is can't touch this or that or you are my face <laughs> amazing name um i still think night after sidewalk is a solid like just listen to the damn track night it's after sidewalk is from my very first album i wrote it when i was like a, a wee lad <laughs> and um i would somewhere in the middle i would pick um I'd pick Cargo Cult from Glow. I think that's kind of a, a mid mid career choice. That um, that's kind of that's interesting. Or Montreal from Dreaming of Revenge, which I think is also a little a little bit off the beaten path for me. But but that's everything. Absolutely, so no, it's four. it's very hard to pin down three. I guess I should have said one from each album, but I'll let the listeners kind of go on their own little voyage. But Kaki King, thank you so much. New album, Modern Yesterdays, is out now everywhere. But quite honestly, just listen to everything. It's a whole journey, and it's, it's what what we have in lockdown is we have time. We have plenty of time to to discover music, and I, I implore you to to check out Kaki King's wildly varied discography and also her very cold fingered performance on various national TV shows <laughs> on YouTube. Kaki King, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I'm thank gonna end recording you, now. See you soon in the real world, someday, somewhere. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Hey guys, thanks so much for checking out this week's episode of the podcast. For more information about this week's guest, head to the link in the description where you will also find more information about the Tonewood amp as well as that cheeky little discount you can get as well. Lots of love. See you next time.